Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with former Major League Baseball pitcher Larry Sorensen is brought to you in part by Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum for $38 a month. You can change a child's life by sponsoring them, by bringing them hope, by releasing them from poverty. Compassion does it right. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. It's the best $38 you'll spend every single month. I promise you that. You won't regret it. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast is former Major League Baseball pitcher Larry Sorensen. Now, Larry pitched in the majors from 1977 to 1985 and then was out in the year of 1986, came back and pitched in 1987 and 1988 before retiring. He was a pitcher at the University of Michigan in college and then came to the majors and made his major league debut on June 7th, 1977 at the age of 21 with the Milwaukee Brewers. A year later in 1978, he was in the All-Star game pitching with the Brewers and representing them. He pitched in 346 games in the major leagues. He had quite a, a long career. And when he retired and after he, after he retired, he became a broadcaster. And he had a, a, a desire and a, a drive to become a broadcaster, specifically with the Detroit Tigers, which is where he ended up. But that's just the beginning of Larry's story. Larry Sorensen is an alcoholic, uh, is an addict, and has struggled for many, many years with substance abuse. And this podcast talks a little bit about his baseball career and certainly what he accomplished, but it really takes a deep dive look inside the life and the mind of an addict. And Larry, I mean, seven times he was arrested for DUI. That just gives you an idea. He's been in prison. Uh, He's lost it all. Uh, Family issues, certainly losing jobs. He's had a very difficult, tough life, much of which he admits he brought on himself. And yet God intervened and came into his life and helped uh, turn his life around. We serve a God of redemption, uh, a God who uh, gives us a chance to to get a second chance in life. And that's exactly what happened with Larry. Uh, So I really, this interview was a tough one for me personally, just because I have grown up with uh, substance abuse in my life, with my family and with specifically with my dad, uh, specifically with alcoholism. But this interview, I think, um, it's funny, when you, when you listen to Larry, he's very upbeat and positive, which I like. There's not a whole lot of, man, I lived this life and it stinks and it's horrible, although it was. Larry, you can just sense now at where he is in life at 62 years old, that he understands that God has given him another chance and that life is short. Uh, in many ways, in, in many times, Larry thought that he should have been dead. Uh, but he's not. He's here, and uh, we're grateful that he came on the podcast and shared his story. So let's get right to it. Without further ado, uh, the incredible redemption story, as I like to call it, a former Major League Baseball pitcher, Larry Sorensen, here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Take a listen. Larry, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Yeah, Larry, it's good to talk to you. And there's so much of your story that I want to talk about that doesn't include baseball. But let's start with baseball for a moment, and then we'll kind of go into your your personal journey as well. You pitched 11 years in the big leagues with seven different teams, most notably the Milwaukee Brewers. And I feel like baseball was in its heyday during those years that you pitched in the late 70s, early 80s. I was a kid growing up in the early 80s. Uh, you were a young guy, just 21, <laughs> when you made your Major League Baseball debut. Let's go back June 7th, 1977. Start there when your Major League career began. What do you remember about that game and that day? Well, I'd left the University of Michigan after my junior season, and I'd just gotten a call from my college teammates, and they said, yeah, well, we're playing South Carolina in the regionals, and I'd just gotten the phone call, and I said, well, I'm pitching against the Orioles in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> so that sticks out because I still get ribbed by them, but it was a whirlwind because it happened so quickly, less than a year in the minor leagues, 
everything fell into place. I was called up to pitch the Hall of Fame game in Cooperstown against the Mets, pitched against Willie Mays and went seven innings in that game. And Bud Selig was there with all the front office, and they sent me to double-A the next day. Short time in triple-A, and I was in the big leagues and really didn't know how to act. You know, really was just young and befuddled and didn't really know where I was. But uh, it worked out. It worked out just fine. What do you remember about that first game, just being 21 and young and and specifically just, you know, performance and putting on the uniform? What sticks out? I had to borrow shoes. <laughs> I had, they had blue shoes with yellow stripes, and I had to borrow a pair. So Sal Bando was our veteran third baseman, and he gave me a pair of shoes. So I remember, and, and Sal, if you recall, was only about five foot ten and weighed about two fifteen or so, and he had really flat feet. So they were these really wide, wide shoes that didn't fit very well. But uh, and I've still got pictures of them. But I pitched pretty well. Left with I think uh, two outs or one out in the sixth inning and a four to two lead. But a couple of guys on base and the bullpen unfortunately let those runs come in. So I got a no decision in that game. But still great great memories. And uh, the other thing that I remember is we had a lousy team that year. We lost ninety five games in that in that nineteen seventy seven season. And they fired a slew of people and we turned it around for the entire state the following season. Wow. Well, the following season was 1978. You were a all-star, and the 2018 Major League Baseball All-Star game recently took place, and that's 40 years ago now. You pitched three scoreless innings. You didn't even start the game, and you pitched three scoreless innings, which would never happen in an all-star game today. Uh, Milwaukee was in the American League then, and you were on a team with guys like Rod Carew and George Brett and Reggie Jackson and pitching against guys like Pete Rose and Dave Winfield and Joe Morgan Tell me about memories of pitching in that baseball all-star game 40 years ago. Well, since it was 40 years ago, I've, I've been asked that question quite a bit recently, and, and a couple of things stick out. Somebody said, were you nervous? And I, I recently had the chance to see the tape. I hadn't even seen any of the tape of me pitching. Hmm. And as I watched it, and I was getting the ball back from George Brett at third base, I knew how nervous I was. And obviously he did too, because he came in and he kind of tapped me on the backside and I could see he was trying to calm me down because I was just 22 years old. And, and as I said, everything was a whirlwind, you know, it was surreal and you didn't, you couldn't even really appreciate the fact that you were on, on the mound pitching to those kinds of guys. It was a very bizarre thing. We're talking to Larry Sorensen here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Now your struggle with substance abuse started to become public during your Major League Baseball career. You had a suspension in 1986. Tell me about when that sort of struggle, maybe it wasn't even a struggle, but when substance abuse began for you, because I know for a lot of people, my father included, it wasn't a struggle early on. It's what it develops as you keep going. Tell me about where that kind of began for you. Well, in my particular case, it was a struggle early on because I came from a parochial elementary school that had about 32 students in it, in a school of 300, into a public high school that had 550 kids in my high school class, just mm. my class, 2,500 overall in the school. And I didn't know any of the kids because I'd come in from the, I'd come from the smaller school. And so I was just trying to fit in. And I remember distinctly my freshman year in high school, I wasn't playing football in the fall and got invited to a, uh, a bonfire and drank my first bottle of Boone's Farm when I was 13 years old and got sick to my stomach. And that really was the start of it. And I maintained, I continued to drink through high school, fitting in with that class. And even though I was an athlete and ended up playing all three sports, um, I just didn't change the lifestyle around. Got to college and by that time was having success and enjoying the victories of the success and continued to uh, the partying lifestyle through that period and continued to have the good times on the field. And so it didn't seem like it was that big of a problem. My junior year, I was the social director of the fraternity house that I lived in and really kind of started perfecting things then. And that followed me through into the uh, baseball career and professional baseball. So it started, it started at an early age, as it does with most, most kids today. I'm involved with a program in North Carolina, and they say that the, uh, the kids start making decisions between the ages of about 12 to 14 is when you make those kinds of lifelong decisions. Peer pressure is so much of a problem with, uh, or not a problem, but an, a thing that kids deal with. I wonder for you if that was a part of it, even as you started to get older, because success on the field can sort of mask a lot of what that what is going on behind the scenes. I wonder if that was the case with you. 
I think sure it was a part of it because, you know, nobody knew who I was and I knew I was going to play basketball at the high school and obviously baseball was my best sport. Um, but nobody really knew me too much. And so when I started the school year, not playing, not hanging around the athletes, um, I, I ran with a different kind of crowd. I ran with a different crowd and found acceptance with them and was funny to them and everything else. And so that was the way that I started out. Then I got into the athletic crowd a little bit more and got dedicated to uh, sports more. And it just expanded the groups that I hung out with. But uh, started probably uh, with, with a different kind of crowd when I got to high school. And peer pressure, absolutely a part of it. When was there a moment where you were like, all right, maybe this is getting a little out of control here, you know, when you were playing? Or did you even recognize when you were playing, maybe even in college or as you got to the major leagues? that there was a problem developing. Well, first, first of all, Jason, I'm pretty thick-headed. You know, you got to take that two-by-four to my head a couple of times <laughs> before it really sinks in. Yeah. I, I think the fact that I was having so much success really masked the fact that I was tearing myself up and, and doing bad things. Um, if you recall, during that, during that time, you talked about the heyday of baseball, but it was also the heyday of cocaine coming into the country. Mm -hmm. And the late 70s, early 80s was really when uh, doctors and lawyers and everybody else and movie stars were starting to get into that lifestyle. Well, I was 23, 24, 25 years old, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, which was a lot of money back in those days, traveling from coast to coast in private airplanes with the team on a charter and living kind of a rock star life, you know, getting into a lot of different things. So I just figured the success was always going to come. I didn't really appreciate what what the uh, drugs and the alcohol was doing to my body or how much more success I might have had had I not gotten into that kind of a lifestyle. Yeah, I remember talking to uh, Daryl Strawberry and, I, and Dwight Good and a couple of guys who both struggled mm -hmm. with their substance abuse as well. And, and um, you know, it was funny during the playing years when they were struggling with it, they would tell me that they weren't really able to fully uh, address it because of the enabling or the yes, whatever you want type of people that they were around. Did you find that to be an issue with yourself as well? No question about it. You know, you uh, I'm talking to some people now that have alcohol problems, and I try to talk to as many people as I can about it to hopefully save them some of the pain that I had. But uh, you feel like you're invincible. And, you know, I just said to somebody recently, you got caught once. How many times have there been you could have been caught? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had seven DUIs and could have had 700 probably. Yeah. And there were a large number of them when I was stopped by the police or uh, whatever and, and just was that we'll follow you home, we'll take you home, whatever the case may be you know, and let me off. So that the enabling is certainly a part of it. The feeling is an athlete because we all have that little swagger to us as athletes thinking that, you know, I was a pitcher with very, very average major league stuff. And so if I didn't believe I was the best guy out there, nobody else was going to believe it either. That was the attitude I started the day with. And so I was cocky to the, because I was trying to overcome a little bit of a lack of talent. And you just have to believe you're the best. Well, that sometimes ran into the personal life as well and got carried away with it. Tell me about 1986 and the suspension. I know there was a lot of other guys that were involved in that as well. Did that open your eyes at all? Or was it, again, just something like, you know what? Okay, we got this. We'll deal with it. And I'm still playing baseball, so we'll move on. Well, I really considered it more of a uh, piece of bad luck. You know, essentially it came about because Keith Hernandez got onto a witness stand and got, and he told me later, he said, I was scared to death. I was nervous. I didn't know what was happening. And your face front flashed in front of my eyes. And so I blurted out your name. And Keith and I had been casual users of cocaine together. And, um, and he was having some trouble with his wife at the time, lived about a mile past me in St. Louis and used to stop at my house to get out of the house. And he'd go downstairs and play on our pinball machine while we were going about our daily uh, routine, getting ready to go to the ballpark. So, you know, and, and I convinced myself it was just bad luck that he mentioned my name. Now you look back at it and you say, well, if you hadn't been doing what he said you were doing, right. you wouldn't have gotten, you know, everything that happened. So it certainly was my fault is my fault and I fully take the blame for all of it but you couldn't convince me of that at that particular point in life so there's cocaine and there's alcohol abuse here so I know the alcohol is what really started to 
to to go downhill for for your life but was when did cocaine sort of go away you know or was that also a problem for many years no oddly enough it was 1986 because my son was born in 1986 and i mm. i gave up marijuana and i gave up cocaine and i did it overnight and haven't since and I just I dropped it like that. The alcohol was another story entirely, and I was I was never uh, never able to get away for that for an extended period of time, really, until January twenty seventh of two thousand fourteen. And we're going to talk about that date. I love hearing that you have the exact date remembered, and that's awesome. We're talking to Larry Sorensen here, former major league pitcher on the Sports Spectrum podcast. When you retired after eleven seasons. This is two this is nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine, somewhere in that range. Your last season in the majors was nineteen eighty eight. You begin a broadcasting journey. So tell us about your journey from retirement to broadcasting and you're still broadcasting today and why that seemed to be a natural fit. Well, I went to the University of Michigan, and I was uh, I majored in speech in the radio, TV, and film department, and I minored in journalism. Uh, I grew up in the Detroit area, and I had two goals in life. I wanted to be a Major League Baseball player, and I wanted Ernie Harwell's job because that was who I grew up listening to. And so mm-hmm. I set those goals early on. And interestingly, by the time I was 40, I had done both. And, it, you know, it's kind of uh, it's a similar story to Buzz Aldrin's. When he walked on the moon, he was coming back and he said, well, my entire mission in life has been to walk on the moon. <laughs> well, I have. So now what? <laughs> yeah. And he took to alcohol as well and writes about that very openly and freely. And I was kind of in the same place. You know, I had done both. And that's that's kind of the time when the alcohol really became bad it was in the early 90s, a couple of years after I retired. And my dad's personal struggle with alcohol, especially early on, he was able to not have that affect his job. He drank, but when it was time to go to work, he could put that aside. And then, and then he couldn't, and he ended up losing his job because of the alcohol abuse, and it really started to spiral downhill for him. I wonder for you, were you able to keep your substance abuse, your drinking sort of separate from your job as a broadcaster for a, a specific amount of time? I thought that I was. I didn't realize exactly how much people were noticing. You know, people think that uh, alcoholics think that they're masking it. They think that vodka doesn't smell. They think that nobody knows when they slide out to go uh, outside for a quick walk that they're stopping underneath a bush where they've hidden a bottle Mm. or whatever the case may be. And I was able to function. I was able to keep broadcasting. And I did get that Tiger job after five years with ESPN uh, doing two games a week. So on, on, I did Monday night, I did Tuesday nights and, fr- and Friday nights for ESPN. Yeah. So I would fly out of Detroit on Monday, go to a game, work the game Tuesday night, fly home Wednesday, fly to another city, go to the game, get my notes, work on Friday night, fly home Saturday. So Sunday was the only day of the week that I was home during the summer. So bars, hotels, airports, you know, there was there was liquor everywhere, and so it wasn't really conducive to the lifestyle. But I still continued to work for them for a few years and then uh, uh, decided I had to get a little bit more local because my kids were growing up and just wanted to be around. I was going to ask you about your kids because you said your son, I think, was born in 1986. That was your first child. I wonder where was your life personally during these years, maybe in the early 90s, as as you say, the drinking started to get bad. The kids are still very young. Uh, Where is life personally for you in that? Well, I certainly wasn't the greatest father. I was still traveling a lot. And even when I was home, I I wasn't the greatest father. I mean, I would would look my kids in the eye and my wife in the eye and say, no, I haven't been drinking. I, I have a bottle of vodka tucked into the back of my belt. And it just became the only thing that I focused on in my life. And it was figuring out how much I needed to get through the day, figuring out where I was going to get the next bottle, planning ahead so that if there was, if I lived in a state where they didn't have alcohol sales on Sunday, I had enough to get through Sunday. It just became the one obsession in my life. And, uh, and it just starts taking over. You start re, uh, reapplying your funds to your alcohol, uh, consumption instead of your electric bill. Mm-hmm. And it, it just becomes a factor in every single part of, of life and uh, eventually led me to prison. Did the kids see this? When do you remember early on when they were starting to notice something was up with dad? Because I can vividly remember years I wrote about this in my book of times when I started to see something was, as I call it, confusing or different or wrong here. Was there... Do you know about those moments? Have you even had conversations with your kid about kids about that? Yeah, I rem- I remember living on uh, 
living on a street in Northville, Michigan, and my kids who weren't in their teen years yet, um, I would say, no, I hadn't been drinking. And my son would go out to the car and he'd bring a bottle of vodka in that I thought I'd hidden because I put it underneath the, the mat in the back seat. I didn't think anybody would find it under there, yep. you know, and, and that's uh, that's just the kind of shape that I was in. So they were aware of it. Um, it certainly, you know, I know that they lost respect for me. I know how it changed their opinion of me. You know, we're in the process of rebuilding those relationships, and it's a wonderful thing to do. My son just recently had uh, my first grandchild, had a little boy, and, and you know, invited me to New York to that's come great. see the baby, invited me to his wedding a few years back. And so those relationships are mending. My daughter and I are getting along. But I also remember my daughter recently came to Florida to visit with my new wife, my second wife and myself. And we had long talks. And one day in the swimming pool, she said, you know, Mark and I used to have fights about who was going to call you to see if you were still alive. Hmm. Wow. And this, of course, was a little bit later in life. But, um, you know, it's... The thought that I, I put those kinds of thoughts in two young people's heads is uh, is a pretty embarrassing and and uh, and regrettable moment of existence. Larry, was faith ever a part of your life at all until later in your life? I know there, there's a faith story here that we're going to tell in a second, but I just wonder for growing up, you know, even going you know through 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 playing baseball in Michigan and the major league major leagues is. Was God or Jesus or faith ever a part of your life? Absolutely was. And mm. I was from a kind of a lower middle class family, but we were German Lutheran, went to Trinity Lutheran Church in, uh, in Mount Clemens, Michigan. And my parents were very, very good friends with the teachers and the principals and the pastors. And they had two groups. And, uh, and it's kind of a funny story now, but they had two groups. They were in the Bible study group and they were in an investment club. And on a Wednesday night, about once a month, every couple of months, they would come to our house. It was our rotation. And for the Bible class, they would uh, study the Bible, and they would sing hymns, and they would have coffee and donuts after it was over. Mm. And then for the investment club, with the same group of people that included teachers from my elementary school, they would have their investment club meeting and then drink beer and sing a different kind of songs. <laughs> you know. And I'd sit on the steps and listen to both. Yeah. So Jesus absolutely and God were absolutely a big part of my upbringing. It was a it was a Lutheran parochial school that I went to, so I had Bible classes every day at the school and the pastor would come in and teach and so on and so forth. But I just got to thinking, you know, I was a little bit bigger and didn't have time for that as life went on and I was having the successes I had on the athletic field. We'll have more of our conversation with Larry Sorensen in just a moment, but want to take a second to tell you about Compassion International, $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Sponsor a child today. This is your chance. You always think about, okay, how do I want to spend my money to help and serve others? Well, this is a chance for you to directly impact a child, and you get to go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum Pray about it. Select the child that you feel the Lord is leading you to, and you sponsor that child. You provide them with food, education, clothing, the knowledge of Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Over 150,000 children came to know Jesus Christ through the great work being done at Compassion International. It's such an easy way and such an important, impactful way for you to help a child. Compassion.com slash sports spectrum, $38 a month. Sponsor a child today. Now back to our conversation with former Major League Baseball pitcher Larry Sorensen here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. You said in the 90s and in the early 2000s, I think the number was seven that you said on DUIs. I know there was five different ones uh, that I had written down in my research. Tell me about these years and the drinking escalating, the DUIs and and even maybe treatment, because I know my dad was in and out of rehabs for 25 years uh, before he was able to get sober. So I wonder for you, even in the midst of these DUIs and the struggles, were you getting treatment? Well, 1992 was the very first uh, drunk driving offense that I got. And I, oddly enough, I just ran into some people at a golf tournament that I was in in Detroit, whose house I'd been at when uh, when I left there to go see my father, who was in the hospital, and I ended up picking up a DUI that day for the first time. And the, the drinking just got worse. I had a lot of difficulty um, getting back into the real world 
not being the star that was being looked up to anymore or the celebrity baseball player. I had a lot of trouble with retirement because you get consumed with the passion of the sport. And I still have the passion for the sport, um, but you just become consumed by it. And I had a lot of trouble with that adjustment. I think a lot of athletes do. And it just continued to get worse. I was having marital difficulties because I was really behaving badly. And I was not a good father, not a good husband. And so the marriage was falling apart. And she stuck with me probably a lot longer than she should have. Mm -hmm. I had one opportunity at rehab, and I spent 30 days in a rehabilitation facility because the judge said it was either there or go to jail or prison. And so that made that choice pretty easy. But the same judge said to me, she said, Mr. Sorensen, you're not drinking to get drunk anymore. You're drinking to get off the face of the earth. Hmm. And it occurred to me, but it didn't really sink in. You know, I didn't really want to kill myself. I just didn't really care if I lived. Hmm. And that went on for a long, long time. And so, and so the way that I escaped that thought was to just self-medicate and to, you know, get into that cruise mode where I didn't feel anything because I was just drinking all the time. And it got to the point where I was drinking every day, drinking a lot every day, and uh, just pickling myself from the inside out. Explain the difference between, I guess, suicidal thoughts and just not caring if you live. There's a, there's a difference there, I could sense. Uh, but explain that in terms of what you were feeling. Well, I didn't, you know, they always, every time they'd take you to the hospital, they would say, do you, do you think about killing yourself? I said, no, even though I was yeah. with the alcohol, right. even though I was, I didn't think of it in terms of, you know, the same as sitting in the garage with the doors down and the car running. Right. Uh, I didn't think of it in terms of jumping off a cliff or driving into something or getting a gun. Um, and I had guns around for a while when I was uh, doing some deer hunting and such with with baseball players. And I didn't think of it in terms of I want to end my life and, and planning out how I could do it. I just didn't really see any reason to stop doing anything. And, and if I died, I died. And if I didn't die, I didn't die. And I'd figure tomorrow out tomorrow. Hmm. So there wasn't a lot of planning going out. There wasn't a lot of thinking about the quality of life. It was just essentially trying to get through the day. Depression, of course, um, set in. And I'm normally a very upbeat person. The glass is always at least half full. And I'd gotten away from that kind of a frame of mind, too. Does Emma, I don't know the answer to this, so I'm asking it. Does Major League Baseball offer any type of programs yes. for, for retired players? They do? Yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they do. Were you a part of those? In fact, they did help me. And Sam McDowell, you probably remember that name. Yeah, Indians, right? Was, sure. Sudden yeah. Sam McDowell was the head, an alcoholic himself, was the head of it for a very long time. Um, I just wasn't buying into the program. I mean, you know, part of my sentences was always go to AA, and so I would do that. And I would go to some outpatient therapies, and then I would just fall away from it and drink again. Well, finally, I was, when I came out of prison, I was in, uh, I was in Grand Rapids, Michigan, because my son was playing baseball there. And so I was released from prison, and I went to Grand Rapids. And I fell on some ice because I was drinking, and I tore up my left shoulder. Not my pitching shoulder, but my left shoulder. Hmm. And I needed surgery because I, after about a month, I completely lost the use of my left arm. And baseball has a group, and I'll be thankful to them for the rest of my life, called the Baseball Assistance Team, BAT, B-A-T. Yeah, sure. And... Um, my sister finally uh, convinced me to contact BAT because I had no insurance. I had no way to pay for any health needs that I had. And they told me that I had completely torn up the tendons, the ligaments, everything in my shoulder. And eventually, BAT paid for me to have surgery done where they actually had to put a plate in and, and uh, sew uh, things to the plastic plate in my shoulder just so I could regain use of the arm. And so this spring, actually, I had an opportunity to go out and talk to three different organizations, the Yankees, the Tigers, and the Braves in spring training, and tell my story as, as part of a fundraiser for BAT to try to raise funds because they help everybody from uh, players, coaches, trainers, front office people, minor league personnel, families, uh, umpires. They, they reach out to all kinds of groups that have special needs, that fall into a niche where they can't get themselves covered. And, and it's a wonderful, wonderful group. They do terrific work helping out what's a really small 
uh, unique kind of a uh, uh, organization, the world of baseball. Yeah, Bat is a great program. I got a friend of mine who works for Bat, and I know uh, in talking to her that there's just uh, wonderful things happening that aren't being publicized, but they're just there to serve and there to help uh, those well, in need. It, you know, as we were going around on the tour this spring, I talked to a guy who was a minor league coach who lost, tragically, an 18-month-old infant child mm. and had no way to pay for the funeral. Mm. And Bat reached out and, and helped with the uh, – that's the kind of thing that they do in addition to some of the other things. And they don't. It's very it's very quiet, but it's a wonderful group. And uh, there is assistance for, um, you know, alcoholism and drug abuse and support. And if there are any players that happen to listen to this and are down in the dumps and thinking about silly things – and don't think that there's anybody that will reach out to help them. Bat certainly is there to yeah, the baseball guys. That's great to hear. We're talking to Larry Sorensen here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Larry, for many addicts, uh, rock bottom is a cliche word. When did you hit rock bottom? That's the moment when you have to turn it around. I wonder, was there rock, bo- rock bottom moments for you? Was there one moment? I know there was a 2008 uh, situation that took place that was big. Take us to rock bottom and what that means for you. Well, it seems like there were a dozen rock bottoms. Yeah. And I hope that I have hit my rock bottom, but I always believe that there's a trap door in your last rock bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, in the 2008 experience, I think you're talking about, I had to, I was going from one side of town to the other side of town to see an event my son was going to be in, I believe, and uh, and was, was drunk and had to, was smart enough to realize I needed to pull over and actually took the keys out of the ignition and left them in and uh, put the, put them in the glove compartment. So they couldn't arrest me for drug driving, Mm -hmm. but I passed out at the, at the wheel on the side of an expressway. And my daughter told me this story recently. She came and was knocking on the window and she said, I was conscious enough to roll the window down and tease her and then put it back up. No idea. I didn't remember that at all. And I ended up blowing a 0.48 which they say at point three five you should pass out, and anything above that you probably have a pretty good chance to be dead. And I remember I blew a point four eight, and they took me by ambulance to the hospital, and I was flirting with the nurses still because wow. my alcohol level had just increased, my tolerance had increased so much that I still functioned to a semi semi literate point. I'd been in and out of jails, obviously, as I picked up those drunk drivings, and then finally prison. Went to prison for a couple of years, and even that wasn't enough to uh, convince me that alcohol was one of the root causes of why I was doing this. And uh, 2009, I got out and I went to, went to Grand Rapids and my son had some great success and he moved on and I stayed there and continued drinking for quite a while after that. So I'm hoping that, uh, and it still continued, and I guess even prison probably wasn't the rock bottom until years later. I'd gone through jobs, having trouble paying for even a small condominium that I looked at, my family had relocated me to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where my sister was, uh, and I continued to drink when I was there. And you weren't working at this time, were you? As like broadcasting was out of the picture at this point, right? Well, I was a Detroit Tigers radio broadcaster till about 1998, and then broadcasting did go out of the picture. But I, you know, the, <laughs> my uh, my mentor tells me that I was a broadcaster. And uh, I was a salesman, so I was both a con artist and a BSer, all wrapped up into one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so sales kind of came naturally. I bet. I bet. Now you got released from two thousand in prison. You said from two thousand nine. Let me do that again. You get released from prison in two thousand nine. You say you continue to drink. A few years later, as I'm reading a story, there's a great story that the Detroit News did on you earlier this year. Uh, a postman named Rick Gefeller changed your life, Larry. Tell us about your first interactions with Rick and how he would eventually make this large impact in your life. Well, Rick was uh, a member of a church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, Calvary Baptist Church. And I, at that point, was had been in Winston-Salem for about six months and thought it would be a good idea to get out of my sister's house and into my own place. So I had a small townhouse uh, in a little part of town, but I couldn't drive. It was right on the bus route, so I could get around a little bit. And Rick was the mailman for that uh, for that particular run. And he used to come to the boxes where he distributed the mail and 
when I could, periodically, I would get out and go see him because that was just about the only contact with the real world I was making. I was isolating myself. I was drinking heavily and really not seeing anybody. This is a point when the kids were arguing about who was going to come see if I was still or call me up to see if I was still alive. Yeah. And I was just isolating at home, watching TV and not doing much of anything else during my baseball pension. And for 18 months, Rick stayed after me in one way, shape, or form to, uh, to come to his church. And he, we played golf once or twice, but I wouldn't go to his church. And he found out that I loved music. I would competed in, uh, in different uh, performance-oriented competitions when I was younger at the school and had the lead in the school plays in high school and musicals and so forth. And Rick found out I love music. And he was a member of this wonderful choir that had about 110 members or so and, a, and an orchestra of about 45 that did these huge presentations every year for Easter and for the 4th of July and for Christmas. And finally, in 2013, after giving me tickets to several previously, hmm. Rick talked me into coming to the Easter presentation, which I did. And I walked in and sat through it, and they had live animals on the stage. I'll never forget it. They built a catwalk. <laughs> it's a church of about 7,000 with about 1,200 in the sanctuary, seating for 1,200. They had live animals, and there were sheep that were pooping on the stage. <laughs> and I thought, any church that let animals go to the bathroom to be a part of their service to make it real has to be pretty special. And the music was just spectacular, and it blew me away. And I went back the next morning. And the next morning, there was uh, an elderly lady sitting there. And so I walked in. I cleaned myself up, and I walked. And it was a mile and a half. And in fact, it was downhill part of the way and uphill part of the way. So I walked uphill to the church a mile and a half. And there was this elderly lady, and I sat in front of her. And she started talking to me, and we had a nice conversation. Her husband came. And this is where we start talking about God's coincidences, <laughs> because her husband had played baseball at Wake Forest University. Wow. So after the church service was over, the woman during the service said, I th the church was changing pastors at the time, and the woman said to her husband, I think that might be our new pastor because he's a young guy from out of town. And I think that might be the new pastor. And I eventually told her, I've been called a lot of things. I've never been called a pastor before. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his name was Jim Israel. He played baseball back in the 50s at Wake Forest, and he became a great friend and convinced me to go to a Bible study class. I went to his Bible study class, which was a part of the Sunday morning routine, and it just changed my life eternally, and God became a huge part of my life again at that point in time. Uh, one of the people sitting in the Bible class happened to be Ron Wellman who had been the baseball coach at Northwestern University when I played with the Chicago Cubs in 85. And since in the wintertime in Chicago, you have to be indoors to throw, we yeah. went over to Northwestern, and Ron was there. Joe Girardi was his catcher. Yep, sure. And, uh, and Ron let us throw indoors over there, Sutcliffe and Eckersley and myself and so on. And all those years later, in 2013, I go into this Bible class and Ron Wellman's sitting there. And he said, well, what are you doing now? And I said, nothing. And he said, yeah, you're broadcasting our games now. And another fellow that was there happened to be the retired chief financial officer of the BB&T Corporation. And he said, after my story got around, he said, you must have financial difficulties. And I said, well, I, for a while, about seven or eight years, decided that the IRS didn't exist. Turns out that the IRS does exist and they want their money. And he said, if you're honest with me, go through everything. We'll get you straightened out financially. And we're at the tail end of a program he laid out a few years back with that. And so all these just miracles, all these miracles starting hap started happening in 2013. And yet I was still drinking a little bit. But all these good things started to come into my life. And it, it was a process. It, it took some changing around. Tell me about sort of, I guess, let's go back a little bit. In the, in the process in the 90s and the early to mid-2000s, is God even a thought? Like a lot of the 12-step programs and the AA programs will sort of incorporate a quote-unquote higher power, but they don't want to you know, discriminate or, or put it in as a Christian thing or whatever. I wonder for you, was faith something that you would sort of look to, lean on, or was it like 
nah, nothing. I'm just going to do what I want to do. The higher power concept. I was in. I was in and out of AA and um, my, my friends back home when I lived at home with my mother for a while. I was in my fifties living with my mother, mm. and my friends called me NASCAR. Here he comes. There he goes. Here he comes. There he goes. You know, I'd be in and out of the program, and eventually, it became and is a very, very large part of uh, my rehabilitation, which is ongoing to these days. I don't say that I'm cured. I don't say that uh, I am a recovered alcoholic. I am in recovery. I'm in remission. And I know that this can pop around any time if I take one more drink. And I firmly believe I will die if I take one more drink because I've done some of the medical research on it. I have a friend that's an addiction counseling uh, physician that has explained some of what happens when you pour ethyl alcohol, ethyl alcohol, into your system and what that chemical reaction is when some people are wired genetically the way that I apparently am and people are wired differently. And he talked to me about the neuroreceptors and the, and the pleasure receptors and the different things that happen when alcohol gets into your system. And so it was kind of a combination and they weave themselves back and forth and, and the people of this Southern Baptist community couldn't understand exactly why we said higher power and the folks that call it the higher power, you know, not everybody bought into the God concept. Right. And what I have found through my experiences with it is that the people that have any long-term sobriety tend to refer to their higher power as uh, my higher power whom I choose to call God mm-hmm. once they get to that point. But it takes you a while to get yourself over that bridge and back into it. And that's certainly the point I'm at. You know, I I have daily meditations and daily and you you might not know this but god lives in the headlining of the car that i'm in because i pray quite frequently up to that headlining looking up and talking to god and having these conversations mm. and uh, and those little those little moments just straighten my head out every time that i do it and i do it a lot you mentioned uh the date of the last day you had a drink earlier in this podcast what is that date again and tell me what you remember about that last time January 27th, 2014, my uh, fiance, who is now my wife, uh, and I were on a road trip. We were in West Lafayette, Indiana, and there was a fellow named Tom Schott, who is the uh, sports information director, vice president of sports communications at Purdue University. Yes. Been a good friend since he interviewed me when he was 12 years old, uh, and I was with the St. Louis Cardinals. I was his first major league interview, and we've come to become terrific friends in the years in between. And my wife and I were at uh, his house. My, she was my fiance then, but I was still drinking. And we had gone on this road trip, and I smuggled a fifth of vodka with me and decided it was a Sunday afternoon, decided I needed to have a little bit more. And I went upstairs, and I'd been drinking, and I took a big hit of the vodka and had an uh, alcoholic seizure. And I fell, and they heard the big thump downstairs, but I fell, and I hit my ribs and my head on their bathtub, actually cracked their bathtub when I fell and cracked a couple of ribs. And they came running upstairs. My eyes had rolled back in my head, and uh, my wife called an ambulance immediately. My wife, again, you know, one of God's miracles. My wife is a uh, registered nurse and stuck with me, and we've been married. It'll be five years next spring. Uh, We got married a month after my sobriety date, that uh, January date. And so they got me to the hospital, and we made an an agreement on the way home as we drove back from West Lafayette about four days later. I said, I can't do this anymore. I will quit drinking. And uh, and there was no reason for it. Nobody else around me was drinking. Nobody, there was no party. There was no nothing. We were watching TV, watching sports. We'd gone to a basketball game, and I just needed to have alcohol in my system and so i was sneaking drinks out of my gym bag upstairs while they were all downstairs watching games and and acting like adults so were you um when you decided to get sober was it literally clean like just cold turkey or did you actually have medication or anything that was helping you along in the process well i spent four days in the hospital in uh, west lafayette and my wife took some time off work And she stayed with me to drive me home. And I kept trying to get her to go home, and she wouldn't. So she stayed with me to drive me home. And so the hospital, essentially, they wouldn't let me go, and I didn't know why. And I said, my ribs don't hurt that bad. I'm walking around the hospital. I'm doing laps. Look how how well I can breathe. I can sit up. I can lift my arms. They said, no, we think you need another day or two. And just stretched it out because they detoxed me. 
You know, they, uh, yeah. they made me stay in there and gave me the medication and had psychologists come in and talk to me and talk to me about AA and talk to me about suicide and talk to me about uh, different things. And I didn't realize at the time that that's what they were doing. But now that I'm more familiar with the process, I understand it and and know that that's what they were doing. And that that, too, was a life changer because they gave me the opportunity in a hospital to get through the really, really rough stretch. So it's four and a half years so, sober, which, by the way, is awesome. Congratulations. Tell me about how you're doing today. I mean, I know you're doing broadcasting and you're still doing Wake Forest games and, and, and some of that, but the relationship with your family, your kids, your marriage, how's everything going now? Oh, life, life is a blessing every day, and I thank God every morning when I get up, and I thank him again at night when I lay down that uh, I haven't picked up a drink that day because uh, there are just so many wonderful things going around. I, I did the Wake Forest baseball games, and I also did the Winston-Salem Dash games because uh, Scott Reed, that CFO, knew the owner of the Winston-Salem Dash, the high A team, mm. and he happened to run into the owner at a tennis tournament and said, you know, we just got this guy that started our Bible class. He used to broadcast baseball and play baseball, and as it happened, the Winston-Salem Dash were looking for an analyst for their television broadcasts hmm. that they did on Sundays. And so I was hired to do that just about the same time I got the uh, went the Wake Forest job. And I started making progress. Life started turning around and getting better. Continued doing the Wake Forest games, which I've done now for five seasons. And last year, Wake Forest made a change in their football broadcast duo for IMG, the Wake Forest IMG Sports Network. They let the uh, analysts go, and my broadcast partner in baseball was the football play-by-play guy as well. And they did a pretty good national search, and they uh, asked me to be their color commentator on the football games as well. <laughs> and so last year was my first year for Wake Forest University. They went 8-5, and five, beat Texas A&M in the Belk Bowl, and had a very successful, very successful run. And a great season, and I'm going to be back for my second year, so everything's great. Wait a minute, Larry. Former Major League Baseball pitcher, and you're doing football games. How does that work? You're a football analyst? Well, I'm, I'm a football color commentator. I'm <laughs> yeah. a baseball analyst. Right, so. right. A little bit <laughs> of a difference, difference, right? A big difference. And, you know, so I do the little off the, you know, around the edges kind of commentary for football. Unfortunately, Wake Forest plays a hurry-up offense. They try to run a play every 11 seconds. So there's just not much time for me to talk, period. So it's the greatest job in the world. Perfect. I stand there and make sure he's got enough uh, Diet Coke and he's got a candy bar and his pencils are sharp. <laughs> and then we get into baseball, and Stan Cotton, who is one of my dear, dear friends and a very, very Christian guy and keeps me very grounded and, and is a perfect foil for me, uh, we get to baseball and Stan says, uh, low, ball one, Larry. And then it's up to me <laughs> to carry the show on TV at that point. A lot more time to fill in in baseball, that's for there sure. Is. There A couple is. more questions here with Larry Sorensen, former Major League Baseball pitcher. So you're back broadcasting now, as we talked about, 62 years old. God's obviously not finished with you yet. Uh, you say, take one more drink, and that could be the end of it for you. Uh, in an article with the Detroit News, you said, I no longer believe in coincidence. Would you change anything based upon where you are today? I always wonder about that because obviously there's regrets and there's hurts and things that you've done, but would you change anything based upon where God has you right now? Well, you know, there, there's a great saying. It says it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt to look to the past. Just don't stare at it. Mm. And, you know, I, I think that if I lose sight of exactly how I got to the point that I was at, where my life was falling apart and I was near death, then, uh, then I think that I could, I could be in trouble going forward. And so I try to remember those things, and I try to remember exactly how bad it was and how many people I hurt. And I went back this weekend and, uh, to Detroit, and I made some amends to people that I hadn't seen in over 20 years because wow. I hadn't done it before, and that was part of the reason I went back. So I, I remember it. And I just consider myself blessed that I'm in the position that I'm in today. And, and I thank God for what he's done in these last few years. And, and you, you hit it, the nail on the head. I think that there's still a lot of work left to be done, and God kept me alive for a reason. A great friend of mine said one time uh, that in the game of life, nobody remembers the halftime score. <laughs> That's true. And I kind of keep that in my head and believe that very, very firmly. 
and and remember that all the time. And and then I have little sayings around my uh, around my office too. And if you don't mind, if I can take a second, one that I look at every single day is right next to my computer screen, and it says uh, it says it's from the big book, and it says today I'm an alcoholic. Tomorrow will be no different. My alcoholism lives within me now and forever. I must never forget what I am. Alcohol will surely kill me if I fail to recognize and acknowledge my disease on a daily basis. I am not, quote, playing a game, end quote, in which a loss is a temporary setback. I am dealing with my disease for which there is no cure, only daily acceptance and vigilance. Wow. And I kind of try to keep that close to my heart and remember it because I do believe, as we said earlier, that uh, if I pick up another drink, it's going to kick off that whole chain reaction again. And you, you asked if uh, God was in my life during that period, and the foxhole prayer was what came into into my religious existence at that time when I was in many holding cells and written on the walls were, dear God, just get me through this one thing and I will give it up. And uh, I never did until January 27th, 2014. Well, he kept getting you out of it and getting you out of it. And yet, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, it's not until you and fully. So there must, you know, Jason, you think about it. There must be a reason he kept getting me out of it and getting me out of it. And Absolutely. I laugh when I call them coincidences because I know that they're miracles. And I know there was part of his big plan for me overall. And I believe that there are many, many more oppor- going to be many opportunities to share this story. And I appreciate the chance to do it. Uh, and two things, you know, it might help somebody else to take a look at themselves, but it also helps me and reminds me every single time I think about this story of where I was and what I have to do to not get back there again. Let's close it with this. And uh, it's a simple question, um, but maybe it's a complex answer based upon all you've been through. But tell me what Christ means to you today, what, what that relationship with him and what God means to you. It believes it makes me believe that I can die today and know that there is a heaven and my soul will be saved because I believe he died for my sins. And uh, I will go to my grave believing that. And, you know, to have come back to the church, I had a good upbringing in it and I just let it get away from me. And God gave me the opportunity to come back and be a part of his fold and to maybe go out and share his story a little bit through sharing my story and get some people to take a look at themselves or, or maybe get some people to help some family members or whoever it may be. And um, I just thank God for everything that he's done in my life and the opportunities that he continues to give me to this day. And I look forward to picking up the telephone because I never know what the next call is going to be. Mm. And it might be, it might be a chance uh, to do something that might help somebody to turn their life around because it took me till I was 57 years old before it all started making a little bit of sense. And uh, I made some changes, some necessary changes that gave me the optimism and it gave me the hope that there are things to continue down this path and the hope that I wanted to stay alive. That's great. I, somebody once told me that God's in the redemption business because he's the redemptor. And I was like, that's really yeah, good. That's and I, good. I can just see that in your life, Larry Sorensen. And listen, it's been wonderful to get to talk to you. Wonderful to hear your journey. I'm I'm grateful, where I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast is grateful to know that uh, you've you've stayed sober for four and a half years, and, and God willing, it's another four and a half, and then another four and a half, and just keep going. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us here. We really appreciate it, and uh, wish you nothing but the best. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. And we do thank Larry Sorensen for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, former Major League Baseball pitcher, and and that was a that was a great. Uh, just a great testimony from Larry on just the the God that we serve and 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 the business that he's in the redemption business as I like to say uh, on turning lives around and really just offering us a chance for hope and that's exactly what happened with Larry and uh, we're grateful that he's sober we're grateful that he joined us here on the podcast and 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 grateful that his story hopefully and, and not hopefully but definitely will impact a lot of people when they listen to it. We hope you were impacted by listening to this podcast as well. We thank you so much for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. As always, you can reach us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum. Of course, we're on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube as well. You can search Sports Spectrum and find us there. You can also reach me directly via email, jason at sportspectrum.com. Would love to hear from you about 
any thoughts that you think about this podcast or any other guests that you think we should be talking to or interviewing. Maybe you have an incredible story you want to share. Certainly email me directly, jason at sportspectrum.com. So we thank you for listening. We also thank the great folks at Compassion International. We love that Compassion is partnering with us. We love what they stand for. We love the great work that we're doing. 1.8 million children have been released from poverty through the great work being done at Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. Here's your chance for $38 a month to impact a child's life, to provide them hope, to provide them a future, to provide them with all the the basic necessities that they need, food, clothing, education, all of that done in the name of Jesus by your sponsorship with Compassion for just $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. I promise you, you won't regret it. Thanks so much for listening to this podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.